Hello everyone, welcome to Nanyang Business School webinar on the new normal in the hospitality industry. My name is Dan Ju Singh, I'm Associate Professor of Management at Nanyang Business School. Today, I'm delighted to have three distinguished hotelers join us for this panel discussion and in a short while I'll be introducing them to you. Thank you to everyone who has registered for today's webinar uh, on this very important topic that concerns all of us. Just a brief background in terms of who is here at the session for today. We have uh, in the total 478 registrants for this webinar today from 20 different countries from all over the world. We've got people from Australia, Bangladesh, Brunei, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, Turkey, even UK and United States. Thank you very much for uh, checking into this webinar today. Even with the time zone differences, you are still here with us. Thank you so much. We have uh, people from the hotel industry and people from outside the hotel industry who are interested in this topic today. Uh, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have questions for the panelists, I would suggest that you submit them in the Q&A window at the bar below. We'll have a Q&A session after the panel discussion to answer some of your questions. For today's webinar, we will not be referring to the chat for questions. This webinar will be recorded and the link will be sent to you when it is ready. Now, allow me to uh, welcome our three distinguished panelists to today's panel discussion on this topic, the new normal in hospitality industry. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Josephine Chua from Ramada Days Hotels by Wyndham Singapore. She is the Director of Human Resources and Quality and she is from the MBA class of 1995. She is an alumni here in the Nanyang Business School. Thank you so much, Josephine, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, next, we have our next panelist, Mr. Lim Boon Kui, all the way who from Bangkok. He's based in Bangkok, Thailand. Lim Boon Kui is with Dusit International and he's the Chief Operating Officer and he is from the MBA class of 1998. Welcome, Boon Kui. Uh, and our third, last but not least, our third panelist is Mr. Michael Ong from Pan Pacific Hotels Group. He is the Vice President in charge of business development and he's from the MBA class of 2002. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Paul Chiu Singh. Okay. And why are we here today in terms of this topic? We want to be, it to be practical and to have some uh, takeaways for all those attending today. Uh, for me, we have discussed this with the panelists. There are three key takeaways for today's webinar session. I roughly call it the three R's. Uh, R, the first R stands for response to the crisis. So you're hearing a short while from a distinguished hoteliers, how they have responded to the impact of COVID-19 on their business. Uh, the second R deals with reopening as uh, hotels prepare to welcome back guests to the properties. What are some of their plans and strategies and some of the challenges and opportunities they face in terms of reopening and recovery. The third R deals with repositioning. As you all know, um, we can't go back to the past. A lot of said about, no, this is the great reset. We may recover, but we can't go back to where business is done in the past. So how hotels are repositioning in the new normal, some have called even the next normal already. So these are the three main takeaways we hope that you, all of you will get out of this webinar discussion today. Response to the crisis, uh, recovery and reopening, and last but not least, reopening. So first off, let me start with the reopening questions. Maybe first off to Josephine, uh, in terms of reopening, what were some major considerations or decisions that your hotels have to make in, uh, in terms of trying to uh, respond to the crisis? Maybe in the months of maybe March or April, in terms of responding to a crisis when uh, COVID-19 hit us. Good afternoon, everybody. And again, once again, thanks for attending the webinar. I'm honored to be here. Um, so because I come from human resources and quality, I shall focus on that. So my other two distinguished uh, panelists will be able to address uh, other matters. Uh, first and foremost, I guess now we know uh, one of the norm is how can our guests, our workforce, and people around us feel safe about coming to the hotels? So, you know, in Singapore, obviously, I, I guess worldwide as well, uh, all the governments and regulatory boards are putting in place safe management measures. Uh, we have also just completed our safe management audit 
SG Clean audit, I'm happy to say uh, we have uh, basically passed uh, all the audit. So this is uh, a number one thing that uh, we have to put in place is, is given in compliance with the new hygiene expectations, regulation, make sure that properties cleaning and sanitization uh, processes are in place. And uh, for the workforce, you know, are they, have they been trained well to be able to handle situations, to be able to you know, handle the new requirement in terms of uh, how they uh, clean the room, how we welcome the guests, uh, putting on masks is a requirement, taking temperature is a requirement, safe entry is a requirement. So there are a lot of things that's happened you know, since COVID-19. And we all know, especially hit by uh, COVID, are uh, the hospitality, tourism, and aviation uh, industry. So we have to be very nimble and agile to get all these processes in place. Uh, operationally, I, I I really would like to leave it to uh, the other two panelists. But uh, uh, coming from a quality background, uh, we also have to put in place all the quality checks and how do we re-engineer our processes uh, to make the future, you know, uh, processes more sustainable. Thank you very much, Josephine. And so over to you, Boon Kui. What are some of the things that um, the, the plans, are, the things that you guys did uh, at Fortuce International? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to be here and uh, very pleased to have everyone participate in this webinar. I think when the COVID-19 virus actually uh, appeared here in Thailand, and uh, it was January 23rd. Uh, one of the most important things that we have done is to make everyone aware of the fact that safety and the health of all our employees and our guests is a top priority. So uh, in terms of personal hygiene, in terms of best practices for cleaning, uh, in sanitation, uh, will circulate it. That, that was our very, very first few uh, actions that we took. And of course, uh, protocols from the WHO, from the Ministry of Public Health, and the various uh, government bodies were, is, were complied with. And uh, we not only look at just on the safety and the health side, uh, but the other very, very important consideration that we took uh, was ancillary revenues. We know for a fact that after the first quarter, after the first quarter, uh, we would be experiencing major declines in revenue. We were able to see that in our booking pace. So from a revenues perspective, we knew second quarter is going to hit and we have to prepare. We will prepare for revenue generation uh, in the areas of uh, food and beverage, in the areas of laundry, uh, where it will be done very differently. Restaurants may be closed. Restaurants will probably have a huge uh, decline in patronage. So we, we went into action very quickly with delivery into uh, takeaway for food and beverage because we need to sustain some kind of revenue going forward. And the third thing we looked at as early as January was cost containment. So we, we, we put our manual in place. Uh, Generally, in uh, our group, we have a cost containment manual that uh, divided into a couple of phases. So phase one went into action as early as January. So th those were the uh, three major things that we implemented uh, right uh, in the last week of January, even before Chinese New Year. Okay. Thank you, Boon Kui. Uh, over to you, Micah, for Pan Pacific uh, Hotels. Uh, what were the actions taken to address the impact of COVID-19 and when no COVID-19 hit the industry? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think my colleague, Leonard, the panelist, has also shared from the HR operation point. So uh, my perception is quite similar, but also a bit different. I think in our operation, yes, uh, we all of us are going to a way, general, general observations, we're going to a way cost contaminate very quickly. As soon as the first case uh, was uh, uh, in Singapore, and Singapore take away, I think in Singapore we're very blessed. I think the government respond very quickly and pick up the case very quick, uh, very fast. Later on. Also, the court contains one perspective. The second area is actually to find alternative uh, revenue model. So in this case, it's uh, quite different from Bunkui experience. I think Singapore 
<clears throat> we do have a lot of uh, stay, uh, stay home notice guests from overseas look, uh, returning Singaporean and all those uh, dependent on it. So that part, I think we, we actually focus on that part. Give us a steady business in the meantime. And of course, for those uh, FMBR, we have permitted to, uh, to open now. We actually do a lot of the, the delivery. I think that's a new source of income that we quickly latch on. I think the other perspective I, I encountered recently, my job is to sign new hotel management agreement with a third party owner. So third party owner, I deal with them constantly. I think the, the big issue is that when to reopen the hotel, right? When to reopen the hotel. And for those who are comp almost want to ready computer renovation, they are going to launch. And in, 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 in one case, ask them to hold back first because no point spending the marketing dollar now when all the travel is being restricted. I think there's no point. So we await. I think the picking of the timing is very critically important. I think the timing when to reopen to coincide with the, I think the uplift for trial restriction by the government policy and that is very important. The other aspect also is important is the, is the working capital management. I think all those uh, hotel in the overseas, uh, those owners that I talk to uh, regularly, they always worry about how long can we prepare the capital to last. So I think we already advise them to get uh, credit facility, get the capital ready and really get to it's, it's difficult. I think timing is difficult. But in this case, you have to pick a time to launch it so that you don't burn a lot of capital and so that you also pick up business at the same time. I think this is uh, challenging, but I think we are work through with, closely with the owner, hope to, in a way, manage this process well. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, what I've heard so far in terms of trying to maintain quality, of uh, maintain operational efficiency, uh, maintaining financial capital, um, preserving cash, and also looking towards the future in terms of what will be different as we move out of the crisis. Um, at this point, I would like to also ask the panelists if you have took a one action, uh, the biggest action or decision you have to make uh, during the response to the crisis, what would be that uh, action you took which had the biggest impact in terms of trying to maintain business continuity when uh, guests are not coming in when some hotels have to close and uh, some employees have to be laid off or furloughed uh, or take voluntary leave. Um, maybe, you know, Joseph, in one action you thought you've taken had the biggest impact in terms of manage the quality or the operations of HR standpoint. Uh, also, the Boon Queen, maybe operationally uh, from the financial part of it, you have a number of hotels in Bangkok and elsewhere. Where there's the difference between the leisure hotels versus the ones in the city? And, and Michael, in terms of know whether you mentioned about the stay, uh, the guests who are staying here in the short term stay versus those who are the business travelers and so on. So maybe your thoughts on this. Maybe up to Josephine first. Okay, so again, I will focus on the people expect. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's just one. Okay, mm -hmm. So we will try to force it. I think this uh, COVID-19, this pandemic is an unprecedented you know, situation. Okay, mm -hmm. We all are just digitally trying to find, you know, uh, solutions and do as much as we can. So let me try by saying, uh, we, from a people perspective, uh, upfront, we adopted the very paranoid approach uh, where our restrictions, our control uh, actually were tougher. Uh, in fact, I would say we were even tougher than uh, what the authorities um, mandate us to do. So uh, obviously we don't know at that point, just like uh, what Bung Kui has shared in January, I still remember uh, Chinese New Year Eve, uh, we basically took the approach to restrict or to control travels. Okay, I'm sorry about the tourism and travel industry, but uh, because uh, the back then it was called Wuhan. Mm. Okay, obviously from a, a, being a people in our person, I, you know, took the approach to first protect our staff, well-being, protect our guests because we interact with guests and again family. So uh, all the way from our executive committee and HOD, uh, we lead communications uh, to our employees to make sure that uh, they are aware of the situation back then. And uh, we actually revamp our entire uh, business continuity process. Uh, 
COVID-19 forces us to make our DCP more robust. And I'm glad to say uh, the entire organizations really put you know, our hands and our effort together uh, to develop a, a very robust you know, uh, DCP. So if I were to uh, say very one actions, I say it's very difficult to just come up with one, uh, but basically the getting the senior management together to walk the talk, to be transparent with our employees, uh, really help us to pull through the situations to date. Okay, thank you, Josephine. Uh, maybe this one for a change. Maybe to Michael first uh, from Pan Pacific Internationals. Okay, I, I think there's a <clears throat> couple of observation. I think not just one action plan. I look at it. This this uh, COVID nineteen crisis is uh, very unprecedented. I think everybody knows. It's actually, you look at it compared to the past crisis. This is actually, I think there are a few key points, right? Global in nature, it affect all the countries. It's a public health crisis. Then, cause uh, the the business to shut down and cause a financial and, and economic crisis. So, and the duration is very unpredictable. So, I think the response is uh, we we also like Josephine has uh, conveyed and. Thankfully, we have a very good business continuity program. We have a practice uh, quite a number of times, particularly last year. And while the practice of the so-called simulation events is a pandemic, so we have we gone through a so-called simulation, and we have a so-called uh, guidebook how to deal with the crisis. So I think we are well, quite, as you say, we are well prepared for quite well prepared for this uh, pandemic. You anyway, know, I think a few key points. First is don't panic. I think that's a key thing. I think it's uh, in a crisis very easy to you overreact and do a lot of uh, sometimes things that you may regret in the future. So I think kidding, don't panic. And we put our business continuing program into action. And then also the, the, the other key aspect that uh, Josephine shares uh, very critical is open communication so that uh, not only just your staff know how to deal with the crisis to, to ensure the higher hygiene, safety standard, and also the, the, the customer being regularly updated and uh, Although it's uncertain, we'll keep our, all those key account customers to be like updated on the event or how we're going to respond to the crisis and all that. And to a different other stakeholder like supply and so on. So all this will have you to, 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 to respond to this in a very coordinated basis. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, yeah, remain calm, coordinated, and <clears throat> use the BCP practice uh, or SOP that we have been practiced and use it to action. Okay, thank you, Michael, for sharing that. That's really interesting. Boom Queen, was there also a pandemic simulation that Ducy International did last year or before this crisis? Well, uh, thank you. I, I, I think the comments from uh, Josephine and Michael are extremely valid. And from uh, Ducy's perspective, we have 38 hotels around the world. Mm. And uh, when the crisis hit, uh, we, we have to take out our playbook in terms of uh, what our experiences were uh, during the SARS crisis and also during MERS. So uh, the playbook was very much uh, a straightforward uh, procedures and standards on sanitation, on hygiene. I, I think that's on the operational part. But a very important part, which was mentioned by Michael and, and uh, Josephine, is about open communications with the three, uh, three very important stakeholders our customers, our employees, and of course, our shareholders. So that communication has to be open, has to be direct. And we talk about key priorities, about cleanliness, about safety to our guests, to our employees. It's also to remind them personal hygiene and the sanitation uh, procedures that we have to go through. And to our owners, it's very important to let them understand what is the business that's going to come uh, for 2020, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter. I think if uh, we have to mention one thing that we have done well, it's the communication process with the various stakeholders. This is extremely crucial in any kind of crisis, whether infectious disease or financial crisis or any kind of economic crisis. So uh, if, if you ask me, uh, communication would be the key and most important thing that we would have to really, really uh, uh, plan carefully and implement very carefully. Of course, hotels do have to close. 
uh, come second quarter. Uh, we, we were very lucky, especially in Thailand, to have uh, a, a reasonable first quarter because January wasn't really affected. February was still pretty strong, uh, though there is a decline. But uh, uh, March, we see the decline. And April, we know it's going to be a washout. So second quarter, more severe uh, measures have to be taken. But our top priority to all our staff when we communicate during January and February was we wanted to preserve jobs. But second quarter, we had to review and we had to relook. And unfortunately, following of our staff, some redundancies would have to happen. So this is a harsh reality. But uh, as long as the communication is direct and is honest, uh, the staff can understand because they know there is a situation that's not affecting just our company, but all companies in general in the world. So situation was very fluid. It's very confusing with a lot of information. So we have to constantly send out information to all our staff, to all our guests, and also to our, our shareholders to tell them what's going on. So in, in essence, I, I think uh, everything is all about communication in a crisis. Thank you very much, Boon Queen. I think that would be my personal takeaway from this first segment here about how hotels responded to the crisis and the importance of communication. So communicate, communicate, communicate. This will be a good transition point to the second segment of this webinar discussion with our panelists. Uh, this will be the time also to do a poll among attendees here. The poll is to ask you for your you know, assessment of how optimistic you are about the outlook as the hotels now emerge from the crisis. So I'll get my colleague now to uh, start the poll for the attendees and the results of this poll will be shared very shortly. So this is a 20 second poll. Uh, please go ahead and log in your response to this poll. Okay, the poll has ended. Uh, we'll share the result very shortly. Uh, but this is a good transition. The next segment talking about hotels are uh, reopening for business. Uh, can I maybe now invite uh, Michael to share a bit more about you know, what were some of the major considerations now as now you prepare for reopening and recovery? Maybe here in terms of what will you see would be one or two key challenges in a reopening and how would you plan to deal with these challenges? Uh, I'll I make some general observation. Actually, I'm not from operation, but I do see, I do interact with my colleague quite regularly. So mm -hmm. I think the reopening is always in the mind of the, uh, the also third party owner, ourselves, third party owner, all that. It's always how to, how to get a business. We, we have been actually doing a lot of training internally. So we focus a lot on the, uh, recently do a lot of training on revenue management. So mm -hmm. actually one, one of my colleagues asked actually uh, what to do with, what, what is revenue management in this, in this uh, period, right? There's no revenue, so how to manage? <laughs> so, so I, think, I think it's the important point actually we are get, need to get ready when the, when the flight is resumed, right? I think that in Singapore context, we, I think last check with SDB, about 410 hotels, 66,000 over rooms, right? So imagine if you open at the same, if you're the flight resume, you're open at the same time. So everybody is just uh, going to just compete on the limited size of the price. So they're going to be very tough. I think it's going to be a price when all that. So we have been discussing, there's no, there's no one formula, but I think these are the key challenges that how to, how to plan in such a way that you, you, you minimize your, the price war. And the operation part, I think all LA operators have done that already. How to stay safe, clean, hygiene, all these things are all, there have been a lot of simulation to get ready for the opening. The perspective of revenue part, I think that's a very difficult part. <clears throat> How to get ready to get a business. I think that part is, uh, I think it's evolving. I think I, I look forward to see how, how, how does the market respond to when the, it's as if all the hotels have been shut down now, it's a, it's a pre-opening for so many new hotels at the same time. So it's going to be pretty challenging. So I think, I think, I think the generally speaking, uh, even the back end operation, everything is ready. The front end is like how to get a business. I think that part, there's no solution. So I think in different region, we respond differently. So for those region, which had the big domestic market, I would say like for example, China, right? So China respond quite differently from Singapore. China, big domestic market. So our hotel there actually already reopened. You're actually doing fairly well in Beijing, but because of second wave now become it drop again. So, so this is actually very evolving. 
I think there's no single <coughs> strategy and formula for reopening. It's, it's actually depend on the region you are in, China, Australia, <coughs> Singapore. So Australia and Singapore actually, we are benefited a lot from the government business, the stay home, notice, gas. But I think once the flight resumed, I think there are a lot of private uh, person needed on the sales and marketing front. Okay, thank you, Michael. I hear clearly about the revenue challenge. Do you have the same view as well, Boon Queen? Uh, okay, to, to answer the question on what did we, uh, what were the decisions that have to be made to do the reopening? Uh, yes, we have to assess the demand. And as what uh, Michael has mentioned about revenue strategies, uh, he's absolutely right. There is no revenue to manage. So now we really, really have to assess where is the demand going to come from? Uh, with all these government uh, regulations, with border closures, uh, with uh, heightened uh, standards in, in, in cleaning, we, we really, really felt that and we assessed as early as March that business will drop between 30 to 50% even when we reopen because we are reacting to a different set of norms different set of behaviors from our customers. So definitely, you know, uh, assessing the demand generators is a, a key consideration that we use. And second, very, very important consideration that we look at is we need to lower our break-even point. Our operating break-even point is crucial. So during this downtime, we have to reassess and we look at every single thing that we have from energy, from staffing levels, from uh, the uh, processes on the workflows in order to lower our break-even point. Because we know for sure that when business comes back, it will not be what we had before. It may take between 12, 18 months before we can reach pre-COVID level. So we have to establish a new set of processes a new set of standards in order to uh, overcome, overcome the challenges when we reopen our hotels. So the break-even point has to be lowered. And we took the downtime to look at all this and uh, we managed to do that. And the third thing that we look at in terms of uh, what are the considerations to open is, of course, the market is very, very important. As Michael said, in Singapore with so many hotels, if everybody opens at the same time, we'll all be in trouble. So we, we need to assess uh, how is the market going to respond in terms of the supply? Are people coming on slowly or do we want to be the first or do we want to be the last? So uh, we always, in Thailand, we try to be the first because uh, uh, we, we, we have been here for the last 70 years and people look at us as uh, an example of confidence. So uh, when we look at Hua Hin and we look at Pattaya, uh, those were our two hotels that we reopened uh, the beginning of June when the government released the restriction. So why do we decide an opening on the first day the government allowed us to open? It's because we know that domestic tourism, which is allowed in Thailand, will be generally by road. So people will drive to this destination. So we were the, uh, one of the first few hotels to open and uh, yes, it's a very tough call because uh, domestic business comes only during the weekend. So during the week, what do we do? But that's a consideration we have taken and we try to build strategies to encourage uh, uh, weekday business. And uh, so far, I can comment that our hotels on Fridays and Saturdays are doing very well in Hua Hin and Pattaya uh, because the, local, uh, the locals are very, very keen to get out of Bangkok, and uh, that's some some uh, light at the end of the uh, end of the tunnel, if I may. Yeah. It's good to hear that. Thank you for sharing that, Boon Queen. Um, we will talk about me the HR here yeah. as well, in terms of you know, the challenges you're facing now in terms of reopening properties for Ramada and Days hotels. Okay, um, so uh, as you know now, the additional hygiene requirements, safe management is has become a norm. Uh, there will be drop in on the onset productivity. There will be additional costs. Okay, so cost containment, 
cost management uh, will be something we will deal with. And with my you know, technology head, I've been also uh, accelerating uh, programs uh, to technology, use of technology in the hotels. So this is something, you know, uh, again, within a very short time, we have to accelerate programs that we probably planned for 2020 to 2022. Everything has to be, in a way, brought forward because we need to compensate the additional you know, requirement. Um, from a people front again, of course, customers, we will have to work on customers' confidence with our hotels and employees in terms of, uh, you know, if they have any fear about, you know, any safety considerations because we do have, in the hospitality, we do have some uh, more mature and elderly workers that we have to take care of. Uh, for sure, I think uh, one point to note the real bit is that I think COVID-19 has brought all the hotelers you know, very well together. Competitors become you know, friends <laughs> to work on the solutions. So I think uh, um, for HR, we also do have to deal with uh, readiness of employees now. A lot of them or a portion of them from executive office are working from home. So working from home, there are its own level of stress to manage. And having said that, now bringing them slowly uh, back to the office is another transition. So, you know, who, who get to, who, who will continue to stay at home? Who should be coming back to office, for example? So there are actually you know, multiple challenges that uh, uh, we are managing you know, at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, my takeaway from this segment here would be, I think, picking up a word that Josephine used, transitions. So every wedding is a series of transitions. And hearing from Michael, we need to be open. It's not just one silver bullet or one strategy, one solution. Uh, we need to be very agile as we look at the situation evolving. And I hear from Bunkui as well, uh, look for new opportunities in terms of trying to figure out the new normal out there as we emerge from the crisis. Uh, at this point, maybe I will get my colleague to share us the results of the poll that the attendees completed just a few minutes ago. Uh, I believe that the majority voted uh, quite optimistic. Uh, can I invite our panelists to look at the poll results? Can you see the poll results here? So I think 9% very optimistic. 56% uh, more than 50% quite optimistic about the business outlook when the pandemic recedes. 31% uh, quite pessimistic and 4% very pessimistic. So looking at the results of the poll here from the attendees, uh, we've got more than 50% quite optimistic, but also a significant portion, about a third, who are quite pessimistic. Uh, this will transition to maybe the closing part here in terms of the final R, as I call this the crystal ball moment, trying to look into the future, the new normal, as hotels are positioned for themselves in the new normal, how to compete, and the new opportunities out there. Uh, maybe as we get started, we'll bring in the Q&A very shortly. Uh, but maybe I'll ask Josephine to start. You look at in terms of the you know, uh, repositioning in normal. What is you know, your response to this poll here? The results, quite optimistic versus the quite pessimistic. So uh, the future of hospitality to tomorrow's hotels, how different would it be? I think uh, at least, you know, there is a little bit of unsinkang or peace of mind that <laughs> more than 60% are quite optimistic. I applaud you know, the sales and marketing uh, employees or, or, or workforce that are out there uh, trying to create new businesses. And uh, I think nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, COVID-19 hit us also, like I said, digitally. And the adverse impact on the entire world uh, is just you know, uh, unbelievable. And uh, so uh, for, for us right now, you know, the key is to continue to uh, upskill our people, to make sure that they stay relevant, if possible, uh, even towards the uh, future of uh, hospitality. Uh, we have made use of the last two months. Uh, of course, this is a local Singapore context, utilize almost 200K uh, Singapore dollars to send as many as our workforce who are eligible uh, to training. And this, that was the opportunity for them to look at, for example, myself, I'm going for digital marketing. I'm going for revenue management. Okay, so out of the human resources you know, uh, 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 context, so that uh, 
we all can be better prepared. We are more, you know, well-rounded to be able to appreciate, you know, the, the organizations. So I don't want to take up too much time because I do know we have time constrained to, to Q&A. So, so I, I guess I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Boon Kui, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, tomorrow's hotel? Uh, what will be the new opportunities for Ducid in Bangkok or in properties elsewhere? Uh, well, the, the optimism is definitely there. Uh, we expect people to travel. COVID or no COVID. I think this is something in human nature. Everybody wants to travel because of one very important thing, which is to experience new experiences. And I repeat the word, to experience new experiences. And it's very, very crucial what is the meaning of new experiences in the context of post-COVID. Uh, a flexible experience is very important, together with a very quality experience. So flexibility is something that will be the new norm. Customers coming to hotels, coming to resorts, uh, will need to have a lot more flexibility because why? The previous travel landscape that we know will no longer be there. We need to, we need to rethink and we need to envision a new travel landscape. The new demands of the travelers are people, are individuals. Group travel will be minimized. And what do these individuals actually want? Basically, they want to go to less crowded places. They want to see less people. They want to try local experiences. And they want to control their own time. And they want to do whatever they want. So this is the new experience that customers are looking for. So in essence, is flexibility and do at their own time and do what they like. So when we are envisioning the new service, uh, new services, the new products, we have to look at what exactly is the new traveler looking at, All right? The millennials are very important. The couples are very important. The younger generation are very important because the amount of research that's being done on the, uh, uh, the, the travelers indicate that many of the younger generation, the millennials and the, the couples and the young families, they want to travel and they want to travel a lot more than the people who are slightly older. Not that the people who are older are not traveling, but they're traveling less. So we, we need to understand this data to know what they want and to deliver it to them. So what kind of unique experiences are we going to provide other than, you know, coming to a resort where you have the beach, you know, you have dining. Uh, people are looking for something new. And the new thing that we look at is about wellness and well-being. COVID-19 has created uh, new opportunities, the way I look at it, because many people have been staying at home. So the well-being of the people are important. When they go out, they're not looking for a normal vacation at the beach. They're not looking for a vacation where you know, they, they, they lie down in the swimming pool, they enjoy. But they're looking for something different, something where their mind, uh, uh, their body can be recharged, can be revitalized. So th th those are things that we are looking at in the new normal. And uh, travel is here to stay. I think we are all optimistic. I'm optimistic. That's the reason why we're here today to, you know, to, to, to rethink what is necessary to provide to the new travelers. They're the same people, except that expectations are different, their behaviors will be different. And okay, uh, one last thought, if I may, about people. Yes. Josephine made a very important point. Multi-scaling, multitasking, with one person doing many jobs is going to be the norm going forward. Robots cannot take over the human touch. A high-tech, high-touch is crucial. High-tech high, high to improve efficiencies. A high-touch are basically the key touch points that every single, every single customer wants to feel. That ro robots cannot take over. Right, that's my parting talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Boon Queen. I think in a sense, you also addressed some of the questions raised by the attendees that my colleague has already compiled. So some of the questions here revolve around the new normal in terms of the new business models or new revenue streams that will emerge. I think you've already shared some of these possibilities, Boon Queen, and new opportunities as well. So I think that question you've already addressed to some extent. 
Uh, you also addressed the part about no skills because the multi-skilled workforce uh, going forward will be reality, much more so. And so those are some of the questions that attendees want to raise in terms of what were the skills or new learning opportunities or training methodology going forward. Um, maybe on this point here, there are some questions revolving around uh, revenue and profits. Um, also, in terms of price war, that could be expected. I, know, I think there was a reference to it earlier on in our discussion. Uh, some research showed earlier on that uh, the previous crisis, talking about September 11, the difference between ADR recovery and uh, RAFPA recovery post-crisis. Uh, in terms of the number of months, you not know, expect ADR or RAFPA to recover to pre-crisis level, there's going to be a lag. So maybe to Michael, your point here is that you no, know, if that question is raised in terms of you no, know, there's going to be a price war among the hotels, among your competitors. Um, how was, do you see this being played out in the new normal, Michael? Uh, this is a very tough question. <laughs> I think I think the the again I think being uh, the, the the key was being agile, agility, and and you cannot have the template for all the different destination. Every different region call for different response. Uh, China is a unique region, uh, very huge domestic demand. So my observation is that China, China, I think certain cities, particularly the first year cities, uh, is is uh, you you can make a differentiation. It, the the price price work can be mitigated to to uh, difference in in your packaging, in your uh, private packages and all that. The the ADI I mentioned, there's always the public. ADR, the, the published one on the website. There's a private one that actually is uh, not available publicly. That's actually depend on your uh, negotiation with the corporate customer, two agent, etc. So that space has to be very carefully managed and and I would say a targeted strategy for different region. For for strategy for China cannot be just copy and paste for Singapore. Singapore will be a very different strategy uh, to be used in Australia and Canada and other regions. So just for information, uh, like just recently doing some of the, the chit, chit chat with a colleague, actually surprisingly Canada is recovering quite well. We have a few property in Canada and the occupancy have been rebounded quite quite well, uh, like forty plus percent, right? Like Beijing before the second wave also doing quite well, 40, 50 percent. So it's doing quite well. So that means they are they are they are they're, there's uh from the revenue perspective, the revenue management actually doing quite effectively to capture. Yeah, relevant market share in the, in the country. So, so I think agility, the, the final point of differentiation with your competitor, I think you cannot just compete on price alone. If you compete on price only, all, all race to the lowest price, then I think that, that's, the, that's the very unhealthy kind of uh, competition. We always need to figure out how do we can stand up from the other competitors, doing something different, target a different market segment. Uh, there's always a question of the sales and market. We try to figure out the, the segmentation, which one we have the relative strength and then play to our strength, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, there's a burning question for some of the attendees uh, at this webinar today. I think they agree with you, Bunkui, that it's inevitable there will be redundancies. Uh, they will optimize our workforce very differently post-COVID-19. So the question maybe I'd like uh, Josephine to address is that, are there any best practices uh, from your view in terms of dealing with redundancies or to maybe to talk about no jobs employability going forward. Yeah, uh, I guess in reality we all know. Uh, we read from articles that for the world we probably have hundred million jobs that's going to be lost uh, in two zero two zero. In Singapore, uh, the Ministry of Manpower mentioned to date about twenty thousand and they hit hundred thousand. So it, it's, it's it's a fact. Okay, that's. Uh, uh, we can't hide from it. Um, in the hotel industry, you know, in the past, you never have access. You always have short fall of uh, workforce. But with COVID-19, yeah, on the onset, and probably in some hotels right now, there are still excesses. Uh, first of all, I think in terms of how do we minimize or contain redundancy first, uh, is uh, we have been very transparent with our communication, so the business situations has been very openly shared with our employees. Of course, short of the 
probably the profitability, you know, and the absolute revenue uh, dollars. And uh, so employees are very supportive, I would say. Uh, yes, some of them are worried about losing the jobs, but they are very supportive in terms of uh, cross deployment to other areas. So for instance, because uh, restaurants were literally closed, you know, the takeaway business, uh, really not much, okay, for the last two months for the hotels. And therefore, what do we deploy? You know, where do we deploy the chefs? And um, where do we deploy our service staff? So through a, a communications and through a plan, uh, some of them, you know, were deployed to other departments be it, you know, uh, stewarding, okay, be it uh, a front office in some area. So staff has to be also be open-minded, flexible enough to adapt to the uh, pandemic or to this uh, unforeseen situations. And uh, in return, uh, what we do is uh, we, we, we do take the opportunity, like I mentioned earlier, Okay, look at the workforce and uh, identify, it's a mutual, you know, employee owns and management support. Look at programs that will help them, okay, during the downtime uh, to upskill. We focus quite a lot on, I uh, uh, have to agree with um, Bunkui as well, uh, in terms of uh, service quality. So that was the best opportunity in the last few months to uh, increase the number of uh, service quality uh, training. And uh, um, another point that I resonate and, and that's another angle that I am focusing a lot is, we're not talking about just, you know, staycations or, you know, going to the beach or whatever. Now they are looking at what is your unique propositions now with uh, uh, the experience with pandemic. Okay, what, how are you going to enhance customer intimacy now? What is the customer's experience you're going to give me? Okay, how do you still enforce or, or enhance, you know, the delight to the customer when now probably in the next three months or six months in Singapore, we probably have to continue to put on masks and no handshake, no contact. So the contactless uh, 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 technology moving forward. So, so I think, you know, uh, in terms of workforce upskilling, reskilling, uh, it's really looking at, you know, how you're going to shape it like for the uh, next few months and the future to come and work with our workforce, you know, for them to be able to also diversify into other areas that they, they have never uh, experienced before. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, we are moving towards the end of today's webinar session. Uh, my last question for the panelists, also from the picking up from the Q&A, and for the attendees, we have further questions do pop it into the Q&A uh, window at the bottom. We'll try to address some of this uh, after the webinar with the panelists for those questions not addressed at this webinar session. Thank you for your questions. Our last question for our panelists, um, do you see a V-shaped recovery or a L-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery or a W-shaped recovery or some say swoosh, uh, the Nike shape? So uh, maybe over to you, Josephine, your thoughts, since we did ask our attendees for their optimism or pessimism about the business outlook. Okay, data speaks. Uh, so thanks to the <laughs> participants for sharing you know, uh, the poll. So at least now I can go back and share with my hotels that the, there's 60, more than 60% optimistic. Uh, we don't have crystal ball. And uh, I think I would like to say it would be difficult to forecast but I also have to agree uh, with Bunkui, the tourism and the hospitality market will return. Okay, is when? I'm really not sure. Yeah, so we just have to be prepared. If it does come back rebound quickly, we must be ready to be able to serve the market again. Thank you, Josephine. Bunkui? Well, uh... It's not really a V-shape or a U-shape. I would like to use the term bathtub. All right, bathtub. I, I believe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, uh, we are basically at the bottom and it's going to be there for quite some time. Because for the hospital industry, 12 months is a long time. Mm -hmm. So we, we will see the decline all right, uh, at the bottom for a little while before we start the uptick. Is it going to be 12 months, 15 months or 18 months? It's hard to tell, but uh, we, in our industry, we've been talking among 
various uh, 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 competitors. We believe that it will take at least 12 months before we can really, really start the uptick to uh, pre-COVID levels. Okay. So that's uh, optimistic, but at the same time too, pessimistic, if you're looking for short-term six months gain, I think it's going to be very hard to come. Okay. So cautious optimism, I'll remember this bathtub analogy. Thank you, Bukri. <laughs> right. uh, Michael? Yeah, I, I think <coughs> my perspective this week uh, is a bit different. I think it's very much linked to the development of the vaccines. I, I, on that front, I heard some uh, relatively positive news by, I think at least a few people have been, uh, authoritative figure have been mentioned that the uh, vaccine being on trial now, on human trial and all that, uh, bucket from China. All the scientists are racing to be the first one to, to, to have a vaccine that with minimum side effect. I think Dr. Felzi from the director of the pandemic disease from USA say he's quite optimistic that the, the vaccine will be available uh, by year end. So, so we, with that kind of background, I think going to be, I'll take a, a bit of a quite optimistic view. I'm one of the people who click quite optimistic. I think going to be like a U-shape, but not a very long U. Uh, I, I'll say as Bunkui has said, 12 months is a long time, I'll figure um, I will guess between 12 to 24 months, I think that kind of recovery. Uh, uh, v said unlikely, uh, U said very right, possible. How long is the U? Is it a bucked up or a shorter U? I think all, all depends on the vaccine. With the vaccine, I think the confidence will be back. People will be start to you know, be more confident when they travel. I think one of the key things that probably restrict people's choice is like, how safe to travel. I think this is a question about, it's the, it's the very first question to people in mind. I think once you have vaccine, that question will be resolved eventually. I think, I believe with human race, we will, we will overcome this. A lot of scientists is working hard and all the ingenuity, all the billion dollar of investment to web, uh, medical technology and all those uh, investment by different com uh, countries. I think uh, I'm fairly hopeful that vaccine will come up uh, uh, probably before the end of the year, hopefully. Then we can get back to a new normal Hopefully, the, the waiting time will be shortened as much as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. I think I will use this word to sum up my uh, overall impression of the um, assessment, sense-making of the, what was shared so far in terms of uh, hotels repositioning new normal. I probably use the word resilience, uh, at least from the research I know that's done in the hospitality industry all these decades. The hospitality industry has been resilient. Previous crises, past crises uh, have hit the hospitality industry and travel tourism, but they've all bounced back. So I, I do believe that the industry is resilient, but of course, we can't go back to the past, the old way of doing business. Uh, there will be new opportunities out there. Uh, but the human race, I think all of us uh, are also resilient. So I think uh, this, I think, will probably make us stronger, uh, make us wiser, and we'll come of this crisis, as I like the word used by Josephine, I think there's a community that we build together. And together, we can write this crisis out and come up stronger, supporting one another. Uh, I think I'd like to thank all the attendees today for uh, spending this time with us today. I hope you've got some takeaways as well. Uh, the recording of this webinar session will be sent to you once it's ready, together we also with the questions that have been answered by our panelists. Uh, also, before we go, I'd like to thank all our panelists today for their generosity, their time taken away from their busy schedule, still dealing with the crisis at work and so on, for spending this time with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Josephine. Thank you, Bunkui, and thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before we end this seminar, can I just maybe also uh, talk about this point where uh, Josephine mentioned about no service quality training, skills training, so on. Maybe at this point, we also want to just share very really briefly that at Nine Business School, uh, in the Nine Anxiety Education Program, we are launching a new Executive Certificate of Hospitality Management starting this October. And you'll see on this slide here in terms of uh, equipping uh, hotel managers and people in the hospitality industry out there with skills that will help them to prepare for the new future post-COVID-19. So the link is there. Uh, please uh, look at the information if you're interested in uh, signing for this course. Uh, before the webinar ends, I also thank all my colleagues working very hard to um, prepare for this webinar today. So I just want to wish everybody happy Friday. It is Friday. Happy Friday. Have a good weekend and I uh, hope to see you guys very soon at the next webinar session that we organize. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.